we get into everything, I just want to do a quick recap of Menorcan history. I realize this is like telling the Romans about the Colosseum, but bear with me for the folks at home who are watching. Of course, 1768, Andrew Turnbull, Dr. Andrew Turnbull, receives his land grant from the British government. He decides that he wants to gather uh, indentured servants from the Mediterranean area, bring them to Florida for the similar climate, climate as we all know. Um, made accommodations for 500. The actual number that came over on the ships was around 1,400 individuals. That, in part, was part of why the initial landing was what we could call disastrous. Um, other impact or other issues like Native American raids, disease, harsh working conditions, bad weather also made it very, very difficult for these Italian, Greek, and Menorcan settlers. Now, in the first couple of years, Turnbull, our good friend here, is out away from the plantation. A group of Greeks and Italians decide that this is outrageous. We need to do something about this. So they raid the store, they take supplies, and steal a boat. Now, with the tides and the wind, it took them a couple days to get everything ready to head out onto the sea. Unfortunately for them, ships from St. Augustine actually ended up coming down, capturing them just at the perfect time. Uh, the three leaders, two Italians and one Greek, were actually put on trial in St. Augustine, and they came up with an agreement. If the Greek individual executes the two Italians, the Greek can go free. At first, he said, I would never do this, but after pleading from his Italian cohorts, he decided that this is the best way to move forward. One can only imagine living with that sort of guilt. But those were the sort of difficulties that these people were facing every single day. Now, I don't want to say it was a complete failure, because from our historical records, they were exporting indigo, which was the main point. They were in New Smyrna. Uh, but by 1776, things were looking a little grim around here. They were here for six-year contracts. At the end of the agreement, Turnbull would actually give them a parcel of land for them to farm for, this, for themselves. Story has it that one day, Turnbull had visitors on the plantation. Uh, they were talking about the general treatment of the people, the plantation, and one of the young Menorcan boys who worked inside of the house overheard one of the guests say a phrase that went something like this. If these people knew their rights, they could obtain freedom. Story has it that this boy went and told his mother, who then goes and tells Francisco Pelliser, who is a carpenter here and sort of a leader figure in the community. These leaders get together and decide, I think it's time to take action. If we don't do something now, who knows if this deal will ever come through. We may be working on an indigo plantation for the rest of our lives. So it was decided that three men, Pelliser, Lambius, and Genopoli, were chosen to secretly make their way up the coastline, head into St. Augustine, where they would plead with the governor, Andrew, or, um, excuse me, Governor Tonin, and try and get their freedom that way. So the way Kenny Beeson describes it is by way of beach. Now, <clears throat> after their meeting in St. Augustine, Governor Tonin told them that they were, in fact, the contracts were being breached. They just had to return to the settlement to complete that season's indigo harvest. Actually, today marks the, I can't do math in my head this quickly. Today is November 9th, which officially marks the anniversary of Father Pedro Camps moving the church from New Smyrna to St. Augustine, marking the official end of the New Smyrna plantation. Now, once the Menorcans get up to St. Augustine, they're given small plots of land in the northern end of town, up where the Castillo de San Marco is today. As you walk around St. Augustine in modern times, you'll notice these little names that sound oddly familiar as you make your way through. So, following the American Revolution, the British Empire loses its control of Florida. At that point, it reverts back to the Spanish Empire, starting the Second Spanish Period in St. Augustine. It was during that time that a wealthy merchant named Andre Jimenez moved across the Atlantic to start a new business in St. Augustine. While he was there, he actually meets the daughter of Francisco Pelliser. Her name was Juana Pelliser, and the two end up getting married. It's a St. Augustine love story. <laughs> now... As a gift to his new wife, he actually builds a home. That home today is the Jimenez Facio House. It is a two-story coquina dwelling with tabby floors. 
The bottom floor was used for a billiards hall and a general store, while the second story was used for family living quarters, socializing, that sort of thing. Now, unfortunately for the newlyweds, they both passed away relatively shortly after the completion of the home. Juana dies in 1802, and Andre passes away in 1806. Now, the house remains in the Jimenez family up until 1821. That is, when Florida becomes a United States territory, the Jimenez keep control of the house, but they move to Mexico City in Havana, Cuba, the family split. It wasn't until the 1830s that we entered the next phase of the museum. And very, very interesting individual who I could spend all night talking about. Her name is Margaret Cook. She was a wealthy merchant from the Charleston area. Her and her husband worked in the tailor business, so they were making clothes for people. Once the border opened up to them, they actually made their way down to St. Augustine to conduct business with the people in town. It was after a couple years that Margaret Cook realized there was no high-end places for people to stay. So she buys the Jimenez house from the Jimenez family and begins the process of converting it into a boarding house, which is now our main focus at the museum today. Now what's significant about our boarding house, it was owned and operated by four single women consecutively. So we have Margaret Cook first, who starts in the 1830s. As the owner, she brings on Eliza Whitehurst as a manager. It's under Eliza Whitehurst's control that we earn our title as the finest boarding house in all of St. Augustine, which every record I've looked at is definitely true. <laughs> Your reputation was based on a few things, but mainly the food that you served. We were known for our lunch. We actually served a nine-course meal with lunch, no duplication in any of the courses throughout the meal. So now imagine being a servant or slave working in our kitchen, making these nine course meals for 20 to 30 guests every single day. It's like making Thanksgiving dinner and not getting to eat any of it. <laughs> now, following Eliza Whitehurst, we have Sarah Petty Anderson, and that leads into our final owner, Louisa Facio. Louisa Facio ends up passing away in 1875. And rumors are starting to spin around St. Augustine. There's an interesting individual named Henry Flagler who's been paying us a visit every, every winter, and it seems like he has big plans for the orange groves just down the street. So at that point, our house is slightly outdated. We don't have electricity. We don't have plumbing. So rather than a boarding house for wealthy individuals, we've become more of a long-term residential area. So people who live in St. Augustine are staying in what was the boarding house. We also had our general store open on the ground floor so citizens could come in, purchase some of the different goods that we had for sale. Now finally, into the, ninth, or into the 20th century, less people are living in the house and it's mostly just studio space and merchant space for artists. Uh, we have a handful of old pictures with a sign that says Ruthanna Weavers. It was an art gift shop for tourists coming and buying local art. And you can actually see that right there on Abilene Street in these old photographs. It's very cool. In 1924, we were actually the site of the founding of the St. Augustine Art Association. This is incredibly exciting, especially this, this year, uh, because we've partnered with them again and we're hosting a special exhibit throughout the holiday season. We have 14 different artists from around the area who can basically do whatever they want except paint, use electricity. We have 14 fireplaces, 14 artists who are going to come and set up, we don't know yet, some sort of art on the mantles in the house. So you'll have this beautiful contrast of 19th century history and you also have modern art mixed in with it. So it's a, it's a pretty neat thing we have going. Um, and then finally, in 1939, we have another significant change. The Great Depression was brutal in St. Augustine. No tourists, no money. Even the Leitner Museum, which was the Alcazar Hotel, was abandoned. People were smashing in the windows, going inside, stealing different pieces. So we had a bit of a dry spell in our little town. But in 1939, the National Society of the Colonial Dames of Florida purchased the home. They realized the significance of four consecutive female owners. So from 1939 to 1946, basically all of World War II, these ladies are driving from around the state into St. Augustine while there's gas rationing going on. 
There's also no 95, so they're taking back roads all the way there every single weekend. And they manage to spruce up the house. We have our ladies here. These are the women who actually signed the contract in 1939, and that is in our courtyard today. Um, we have an, a newspaper article that describes a scene from the house while they were restoring it. And the author of the article says that the women would come out of the house looking like chimney sweeps. They were so covered in dust. And I just like to imagine them in their fine dresses that they're wearing here, coming out all disheveled and, you know, coal miner-esque. Uh, but since 1946, the Jimenez Facio House Museum has been open to the public as a museum. For a short time there, the Danes did have meetings up on the second floor. Then I think they wanted air conditioning, so they started having meetings up in Jacksonville, and the building became strictly a museum. Today we mostly focus on the boarding house story. However, in the past couple of years, we've really opened up the range of what we talk about. About five years ago, we really did a deep exploration of the slaves and servants who worked in our house, so we spend a good deal talking about them. We talk about the ladies who own the house, the different types of guests who are coming and going, and we talk about our Menorcan heritage and our second Spanish period history. Um, as you all probably know, historic preservation is a very tedious task. It's a labor of love that takes time, money, screaming at the sky, all those wonderful things. And you have to get pretty creative with the way you go about raising your money. You know, you can't just show up and ask for a dollar. It doesn't work that easy. So we do all sorts of different things. We have trick-or-treating festivals. We had a book festival this past year. We have a specialty tour called I Lived Here as well. We have two different actors. Depending on the year that you've seen, we've done different stories. And basically, we take you through the history of the house using slaves who we know lived and worked in the boarding house. And we tell their stories through these different actors as we work our way through the history. It's a really great perspective on the home, especially for this time period. It's something that you don't hear about, urban slavery in St. Augustine, Florida. So Project Daddle. That was my code name when I came up for this project, because I had no idea what I was going to call it once I really you know, got into it. So Project Daddle worked for the time being. I'd always been fascinated with the idea of pilgrimages and heritage trails. To me, it seems like the perfect way to memorialize and remember history. The physical action of doing something that other people did really gives you a new sense of empathy for what these people were going through. It's like when you have reenactors on a Civil War battlefield in August. They're getting the genuine experience of wearing wool in swampy August heat, but they love doing it because it gives them this unique experience. So for me, Doing physical history is one of the most important things. Um, it came time for me to do my senior capstone project, which for Flagler College, most people write a large research essay, they'll make a museum exhibit, something large. But after my time in college, I knew I was done with the research papers. I wanted to do something big, and I wanted to do something important. The Jimenez Facio House rekindled my love of history, and I knew I needed to pay it back somehow, some way. And I figured the best way to do that would be some kind of fundraiser. So I go to my advisor, Dr. Kelly Enright, who's a very sensible lady. I tell her, I want to walk 68 miles up the coast of Florida. She just gives me this look, like, are you nuts? What are you doing? <laughs> but I showed her the maps, I showed her my research, and I think she kind of got on board. And slowly but surely, she finally approved my project once she knew I was physically capable of actually walking 68 miles. <laughs> so then the research begins. I have to, you know, use my research paper from earlier to build off of. I'm going to the historical society, digging through records, old newspapers, those sorts of things. And I'm also campaigning for the hike. As I mentioned before, historic preservation is a very tedious task. And as my way to pay back the museum for all their love that they've given me, I'm going to pay them back with some cold, hard cash to help preserve that house for them. <clears throat> so what were my goals for the hike? Of course, raise money for the preservation of our house's coquina walls. The way that we have the walls in the boarding house today, we have them lime washed. So a coating, it's a, um, it's a crushed lime mixed with water and a few other things. We actually use a recipe from the 18th century that the National Parks keeps. And every seven years we have to reapply this lime wash to the walls. 
It gives you an extra layer over top of your coquina, and it just protects it. Now, this wasn't always how we did it. In the 1970s, we thought we knew better than people in the past. We ended up putting a latex-based paint over the coquina, and because, yeah, my thoughts exactly, and because coquina is an organic material, moisture comes in, moisture comes out. And if you put that latex over top, nothing's coming out. So they start noticing, why is our coquina falling apart? There's mold building up inside of the walls. So they swiftly remove the latex paint, head over to the fort, get their recipe for lime wash, and start reliming all of the coquina walls. Now, to this day, when you visit our museum, you will see these green splotches growing on the walls. Believe it or not, this is actually a good thing. This is the coquina healing itself over time. It's pushing out the mold and algae that grew inside the walls. So when we lime wash, we also have to give it a nice you know, spray with the hose to get the green algae off. But it's a nice sight to see when you start seeing a spot emerge. You know, what you're doing is actually working. The other thing I wanted to do was create a series of videos to help bring people in the loop with what I was actually doing. So I went and I identified points of interest throughout my hiking route, you know, made little videos on the trail while I was doing it. Of course, I was hiking 15 to 20 miles a day, so I'm making these videos. I'm all disheveled, my hair is blowing everywhere, I look like a crazy person to say the least. Um, but I want to, also wanted to complete the hike in four days. The Menorcans did it in three. That's a little ambitious. Um, so four days was good for me. And uh, I wanted to keep the budget as low as possible to maximize the amount of money raised for the museum itself. So I began my hike on November 27th, 2022. I actually started just out on the front, uh, the front porch here. Greg was kind enough to allow me to mark this as my starting point. I figured this is as close as we're going to get. We don't know exactly where Francisco Pellicer and the Menorcans really started their journey. What we do know is they told them they were going out to the beach to hunt for sea turtles. So, can't really do that anymore either. But, um, so I started my hike first thing, 7 a.m. in the morning. Absolutely gorgeous, as, you know, not really similar today, today, but that gorgeous, cool November air. I'm walking up, a complete ball of nerves, and the cool breeze is easing them as I'm making my way over. Um, as I mentioned before, the way I chose to do the hike was by way of beach. I wanted to follow A1A up the coastline as closely as the Menorcans followed the coastline back in 1777. Now, one of the problems with my plan here, I wanted to walk on the beach. You know, I can deal with the sand, that's fine. But about two weeks prior to my hike, we actually had a hurricane hit, so there wasn't much beach to walk on. So I did a lot of my walking on A1A proper. Um, my first day, I started in New Smyrna, made my way up through Port Orange, went over the bridge in Port Orange, which, can I just say, I have never been so thankful for bridges in my life. <laughs> you hear about the Menorcans swimming across the Matanzas River into St. Augustine, and here I am marching over the bridge with my 36-pound backpack on my back, and I'm just so happy to not be in the river. <laughs> When you talk to experienced hikers and tell them that you're doing a multi-day hike, one of the first things they will tell you is, you're going to overpack. And I wasn't going to overpack. I knew I was packing the right stuff. I had laid my bag out dozens of times, pulled items away that I no longer needed. But I step on the scale before I leave, and my bag weighs 36 pounds. I had all my camping gear, extra food, extra water, other equipment that I needed or thought I needed. And so making my way over the bridge, I was regretting all the equipment that I had on my back. I ended up going across the bridge, finally got my first sight of the ocean. I won't lie, it was very tempting to take all this equipment off and go take a dip. But the last thing I needed was sand in my hiking pants <laughs> as I had 18 more miles to go for that day. Um, I continued north through Port Orange and made my way into Daytona. You can see there is the world famous Daytona Beach sign and there's the Port Orange Causeway there. I ended up stopping at the pier, Rusty Hall, that, um, <clears throat> that
the head of the Menorcan Cultural Society in St. Augustine, was kind enough to donate this Menorcan flag to me before I started my journey. So I figured the guy was nice enough to give me a flag, I'll bring it with me. One of the uh, many, many pieces that I learned I did not need for this hike. But it made a great picture, right? It's awesome. So I went up to a nice couple on the pier here. They were walking their long-haired dachshund, and I love dachshund, so of course I had to stop them and ask them to take my picture. And what I realized was talking to these people, they thought I was some sort of vagabond traveling across the country. I had my hat backwards to protect my neck from sunburn. And I realized, maybe if I turn my hat forward, they'll be a little more comfortable. And I did, and they relaxed. So I kept my hat forward talking to people from that situation before going on. Um, but after that, I made a pit stop at Publix, another modern amenity I was very thankful for. I know Francisco Pellicer would have enjoyed a turkey Publix sandwich as well, but, you know, unfortunately for them, that was not the case. Um, so I continued heading north through Daytona. Finished my day at Coral Sands RV Park in Ormond Beach. Almost immediately when I arrived, it started to pour rain. Fortunately for me, it was just a Florida shower, passed by relatively quickly, and I was greeted by this beautiful sunset that followed after. So overall, my first day I hiked 23 and a half miles in 8.5 hours. I would be lying if I told you my feet felt good. My feet were on fire. It was a lot. I uh, am an experienced hiker. I grew up right next to the Blue Ridge Mountains. I've hiked multi-day hikes before, but this was something else. Something about walking on the street, checking over your shoulder for traffic every 10 minutes. It was exhausting, but Seeing the change of Florida scenery was so cool. Starting in New Smyrna, going up past the airport, walking along the river, the Halifax River in Port Orange, seeing all these cool old houses, coming over the bridge, the giant hotels. We also have the WPA Coquina Bandstand in New Smyrna, or not New Smyrna, Daytona, pardon me, uh, which another topic that I am fascinated by, Great Depression WPA projects. Add on top of it that it's made out of coquina, I'm totally sold. So I was very excited to go see this in person. Uh, we walked past the birthplace of Speed Park in Ormond Beach. Um, <clears throat> so I went to sleep at Coral Sands, had an early day the next morning. I had to go from Ormond Beach to Beverly Beach. The silver lining to this was I knew it was going to be my most beautiful day walking. I'd be on the Ormond Scenic Loop and Trail, so a lot of protected coastline that I'd be going through. Started off going north. Where else would I go? Um, <clears throat> started going through North Peninsula State Park. My goal for that was to see some sea turtles, because that's what they're known for. I had a whole plan to make a video about turtles. But as I make my way through, all I can see is saw palmettos as far as the eye can see. If you ever take a walk through there, you know exactly what I mean. And it was a really cool experience because in my head I'm thinking, this is probably as close to what it would have looked like for these three people walking this way. And that also made me understand why they stuck to the beach. Because you're not making it through all those saw palmettos, those will tear you apart. Um, but right after North Peninsula, we have Gamble Rogers State Park, which to me is one of the most beautiful places in Northeast Florida. It's a gorgeous beach, lots of nature, and of course, this is where I ended up seeing my sea turtle there. Maybe it's a green turtle, I'm not sure. Um, there you go, gopher tortoise. I did not make any stew out of the gopher tortoise, I can reassure you. Yes. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so going through Gamble Rogers State Park, which if you don't know the story behind it, Gamble Rogers was a Florida folk musician. He's known as the Florida Troubadour, traveling around the state, collecting folk stories, performing old songs, keeping the memory alive through music. Unfortunately for Mr. Rogers, he and his wife were at Gamble Rogers State Park, prior to it being called that, and they actually had someone run up to them and say that my, I think it was my daughter is drowning, so he raced out and attempted to save the girl. Unfortunately, both of them passed away and the state park was named In Memorial to Gamble Rogers. It's a beautiful, beautiful park, as I mentioned. They also have this nice little plaque here, so I made sure to get 
get my picture right next to Mr. Rogers here. And uh, so I kept pushing north. You know, hurricane damage was all around. I had seen, I saw something new at this point. Growing up in Virginia, we get snow every couple of winters. So I'm used to seeing snow plows pushing snow. It was in Ormond Beach that I saw a snow plow pushing sand for the first time. They were moving the beaches that had washed up onto A1A off of the street and back into the dunes, which to me was new. But the sand itself was absolutely gorgeous. I understood why it was called Coral Beach. It had this nice pink color to it. Come to find out that actually comes from the coquina clams and other sea life that reside on the shore here. Uh, that night, we rented a small cabin at Beverly Beach RV Park, and I was reunited with my fiance Julia. It was, uh, it was very nice, to say the least, having a nice bed to sleep in, so that was good. I was also able to drop off my camping supplies, because we had a two-night rental. How fancy. So I dropped off my camping supplies, which made my backpack significantly lighter, and made the experience a little more enjoyable than the previous day's hiking. That day was a 16 mile total, and if you ask me, that's one that I could have just kept going all day, because these beautiful parks that we have here in Florida, you got to go out and see them for yourselves. There's nothing like it. And of course, it's nothing against Virginia parks where I grew up, but there's something about Florida parks that just really, it speaks to me. I love them. <clears throat> we start to hit some trouble on day three. I don't know what happened. Maybe I was overwhelmed with joy seeing Julia and eating pizza in our little cabin. But somehow I managed to forget to charge my cell phone. So making my videos was difficult and staying in touch with my mother, who was very, very nervous about all of this, rightfully so, was a little difficult. About a third of the way into my hike that day, my phone did end up dying. Um, so I was out on the trail by myself. But that's something I came to appreciate. You know, it was just me, just the road, and no headphones to distract me either, which was nice. Um, and while I was walking, I really began to think about what it was like to be Francisco Pelliser. For me, in this situation, I was raising money. I had the people who donated depending on me to complete this task, and there was a lot of pressure, to say the least. Francisco Pelliser, on the other hand, had the weight of the entire Menorcan community on his shoulders. They had no idea what would happen when they get to St. Augustine. They didn't know if they'd be thrown in jail for abandoning the plantation. They just took the risk and made the walk. So as you can imagine, what it would feel like to be one of these three individuals, thinking about your family here in New Smyrna on the plantation thinking about lying to the overseers and then finding out that you're actually gone, not hunting turtles, you're going north. So it was a very strong moment for me. It kind of gave me a good amount of time to really reflect on what it was that I'm doing and the importance of being involved in history, getting out there, participating, and experiencing things firsthand. Now we're going through Palm Coast at this point, and I make a pit stop at Publix for another sandwich. Um, I basically lived on Publix sandwiches, and while I was there, I decided to sneak behind one of the vending machines and plug my phone in so I could be tracked by my mother and Julia. Um, while my phone was charging behind the vending machine, people were giving me weird looks because I have all my equipment and everything, so I'm like, you want to know what I'm doing here? So I'm sharing the history of my hike while charging my phone. Certainly some people didn't want to hear it, but others were very, very interested. So that was really nice for me, getting to, you know, pass the time talking history, which always makes me happy. As I'm going through Palm Coast, I notice off A1A, there's a little trail to the side there. It's called the Mar Flagler Beach to Marine Land Trail. So of course, get off the road and into the woods. Start walking along the path, and I come up upon these man-made coquina ponds. And inside the pond, I met this little fella here, baby gator. And it got me thinking about the longevity of what we have built here in Florida. You know, you build these things like houses. You never expect them to be museums. Like our boarding house, the people who were staying there never thought their lives would be on display for guests like you and I. 
to come through and say, wow, I'm happy I didn't have to use a chamber pot. This is great. <laughs> and I'm sure the people who built these coquina ponds, when I did the research behind it, it was some sort of animal sanctuary zoo type place that had closed down. It was a roadside attraction. And I was thinking, these people probably thought this would be here for generations and generations. And now here I am in 2022, looking at this pond, trying to figure out who built this thing? Why is this here? But again, just the connection, seeing Coquina out was very, it was a cool thing to see. Um, <clears throat> following that, we pop out near Washington Oaks State Park, personally one of my favorite state parks in the state. Um, very tempting to make a stop in there and see the garden, the roses there are beautiful. However, I refrained from doing so because I had a schedule to keep. I uh, made my way all the way up to, oh, excuse me. So I actually, after Washington Oaks, popped out by Marine Land. As you walk along the beach there, you'll see natural outcroppings of coquina stone lining the beaches there, which to me is so cool that we actually still have those there today. Seeing what coquina would look like when the Spanish found it in the 16, 1600s. Coming out to the beaches, seeing these large rocks, and some genius had the idea, maybe we could mine this stuff and build a fort out of it. And what do you know? It worked very, very well. And um, <clears throat> so seeing the natural coquina was great. It reminded me of the importance of historic preservation, of preservation of our natural space. And so it's very thankful to see that. Uh, that day's hike was around 15 miles, eight of which were phone free, which, you know, in the end was a great thing. So I, was, I enjoyed my experience that day. Now finally on November 30th, we have the final stretch, Fort Matanzas to the Jimenez Facio House. Started my day at Fort Matanzas, and it was such a beautiful sunrise that I ended up walking around on the beach for about 30 minutes. As some of you may know, I'm very easily distracted, especially by natural beauty, so when I got dropped off, I walked down and I was talking to this, the cranes that were in the water, looking at the fort across the way. And all the, uh, the rangers there were kind of looking at me like, what is this backpacked man doing here on our beach? He looks tired. <laughs> and I was, but I was thrilled to be on the last stretch. And things were really starting to look familiar, and overall that was a very comforting thing to me. You know, this was sort of a foreign endeavor, making my way through, and seeing restaurants that I know, beaches that I've been to, almost made me feel like I was home. Now, as I'm going up through Crescent Beach, I'm on A1A, and I see a nice little sign that says, Honey, today? And I say, Honey, today? Today's today. So I cross the street and walk up the driveway. There's a little hutch there with a sign that says, Diane's Bees. Once again, a very concerned individual comes out and says, Who is this backpack man? <laughs> so I explain myself. I tell her that I'm on an odyssey, coming from New Smyrna all the way to St. Augustine. And she looked shocked and confused. Why are you doing this? So I had to explain a little more. It's for historic preservation of a unique home in St. Augustine. Trust me, it's worth it. I promise you. Um, so she ended up giving me a sampling of all of her honeys. I spent about 45 minutes talking to Diane. She gave me a big spoonful of ginger and turmeric honey. She said, it keeps swelling down in the joints. This will get you home. I know I've been complaining about my backpack weight this whole time. I bought three jars of honey and stuck them in my backpack. When I told Julia this, she said, why did you add more weight? And I said, you got to try the honey. It's good stuff. She's verifying. She says it's good, which we're actually due to stop and get some more pretty soon. So, uh, <clears throat> so after my honey and, er, excursion, I uh, was driving along, and I hear a familiar voice yelling out of a car window. I look to my right, and it's my dad. <laughs> my parents had come down from Virginia to support me for the hike, and they surprised me on the side of A1A. They tracked my phone to where I'd be, and so they pull the car over on a side street, hop out again, sweaty, disheveled me. I'm hugging my mother. I feel bad for her because I'm gross. 
They also brought our little Jack Russell Terrier named Stella, who I absolutely adore. The smartest dog in the world, I guarantee that. Uh, so that was great seeing Stella, eating honey, seeing my parents. Um, and also I was able to actually give them the honey. So I reduced the weight, <laughs> thankfully. Um, now initially, with my video schedule for each day, I wanted to stop at Anastasia State Park right by the lighthouse there. As I'm sure many of you know, that is where the original Coquina Quarry is located. So the Coquina they used to build the Castillo de San Marco came from this location in the state park there. So <clears throat> coming down A1A, actually no, I didn't come down A1A, the road I could have followed A1A, but I was enjoying myself so much that I went up and around towards the beach where St. Augustine Pier is, came around the bend there and cut through the neighborhoods all the way to Anastasia State Park. I'm getting ready to take my phone out, venture into the park and make a video about the wonderful coquina mine that we have here. And that's when I get a phone call from Julia. She says, hey, have you checked the weather? And I'm like, yeah, I'm looking at it now. It's beautiful. And she's like, it's going to pour. Do you not see the clouds? So I'm like, all right, I'll trust your word for it. So I make my way around the bend on Anastasia Island there. And as I come around that turn by Surf Station, the lighthouse, and the park, the sky is purple over top of St. Augustine. So I really had to book it. I'm regretting taking the long way at this point. So rather than enjoying myself, I'm hustling down A1A like this, looking over my shoulder every time I cross the street because I'm not getting hit by a car today. <laughs> that could have happened on the first day, it'd be fine, but not the last day, we're getting through this. So carefully power walking down A1A, passing restaurants that I love and would love to stop at and eat a quick snack, but of course, the rain is coming, so there's no time to stop. As I'm coming over the Bridge of Lions here, well, you can see right here, the start of the clouds. So this is the morning, beautiful skies. This is on Anastasia <coughs> Island, the clouds are rolling in, and this is crossing the Bridge of Lions. Ooh. Impending doom, you can say. <laughs> um, so Julia ends up meeting me on the Bridge of Lions so she can help uh, record me coming over the bridge itself as I come over the Bridge of Lions into the main plaza in downtown St. Augustine. I take a left over towards King Street. It's along King Street where my parents are, members of the Menorcan Cultural Society are there, my fellow staff members and Julia is with me as well. So I'm greeted by this large crowd, people cheering, not exactly what I had expected when I arrived. I thought it'd be a quiet cross the finish line, fall over in the dirt, <laughs> then roll home. But they were nice enough to whip up this sort of, you know, little celebration of my hike. So I come down Avalee's Street, all the shop owners are out, they're clapping, everyone's thrilled that I did it. Um, so that was a really, really cool experience and I was really proud of what I had just done. It was, you know, it was a big deal to me, so I was, I was excited. Ten minutes after getting to the museum, we pop open our champagne bottles, we say, hooray, here comes the rain. Party cut short, um, we basically, everyone had to move into the gift shop. I uh, took my parents into the museum and wasn't planning on doing this, but actually gave them a full tour of the house, covered in dirt and sweat, and Julia tugs on my shirt, and she's like, go home, what are you doing? You can do this tomorrow. But I was just so happy that I had finally completed this journey that I could have done anything. I could have walked to Jacksonville that day, for the honest. Um, but finally, when I got home, you know, sat down on my couch, took a deep breath, and said, that was a long walk. <laughs> so that last day I did about, planned on doing 16 miles, but because of my detour, ended up doing about 17 and a half there. So overall, it was supposed to be about 68 miles with my distractions and side adventures that I was taking was around 76 total miles walked. When I first started, this project, my goal was to raise $1,798, which matches the year that the museum was created, or the building was built in 1798. It took about two weeks to uh, surpass that number, so I definitely lowballed myself on that. 
We ended up raising $7,195 strictly for... Strictly to be used for the preservation of the coquina walls. Why coquina? I will co quote Sandy Stratton, who said it in this very room. Someone said, Sandy, what is coquina to the Menorcans? And she said, it's the sacred stone. And I was like, that's what we're raising money for, the sacred stone coquina. So thank you, Sandy Stratton, for that. It was a huge inspiration to me. Um, another really cool thing that happened was tons and tons of media attention. Turns out it's not every day that people walk 68 miles following in the footsteps of a cultural group. So people were very interested in what I was doing. We were published in the St. Augustine Record. Action Jack's News had us on their website. Yahoo News had us on their website as well. And then something really cool happened. I got an email in Spanish. And I said, Julia, you speak better Spanish than me. Do you have any idea what this says? And she said, I think it's a reporter from Menorca. Someone from the island of Menorca who writes for a newspaper there reached out to me and asked if he could ask me a series of questions about what exactly it was I was doing with their history. So I answered their questions, and we'll skip forward here for a minute. And they published my story. My face was on the front page of a Menorcan newspaper, which, that doesn't happen every day. They had my mug up in the corner, cut out, smiling with my flag. And so there's the headline there, which, again, was so much, so much more than I had ever expected out of this little project I was doing. I thought maybe the local newspaper would, you know, write a brief article about it, but never in my wildest imagination did I dream that this would be an international project? And the feedback from people in Menorca was great. Wow. All of their comments, of course, translated back into English from Spanish, were things along the lines of, if you ever visit Menorca, you will be more than welcome here. Stop by our house for dinner anytime. And I was like, I'll pack my bags right now. Um, but it turns out they actually have a trail that follows the perimeter of the island itself. I'm not hinting at anything here, but uh, <laughs> yeah. that would be pretty cool, you know, really uh, head back to the homeland there. So, <clears throat> But going forward, lots of momentum, lots of energy for this project, and with historic preservation, as you all know again, it's a never-ending labor of love. It would be a waste if I didn't attempt to sacrifice my body again to the Menorcan <laughs> Trail. So we decided that we're going to do it in March of 2024. I will be starting, if Greg will have me, here at the New Smyrna Museum once again. I will be venturing up north by way of beach. And why March? Because it's Menorcan History Month. So we're going to tie in my hike with all the events that are going on up with the Menorcan Cultural Society in St. Augustine. I highly, highly recommend you subscribe to their, their email list. They have a lot of great programs coming up. It's not my place to reveal what exactly they're planning, but Julia and I have been in cahoots with them since the last <laughs> hike, and uh, we're pretty excited about what they have planned. So it's looking like either the last weekend in March or the second to last weekend in March. Details coming soon. We've got to figure out when bike week is. <laughs> that, uh, what a contrast. Motorcycles and Menorcans. <laughs> So I'll be following the same route up the coast. One of the most frequently asked questions that I get, some wise guy in the audience always says, what about the old King's Road? And I'm like, I wish. I wish I could do the old King's Road. And what's special about the old King's Road is after Palliser got back and they were escorting the rest of the colony back to St. Augustine, <coughs> excuse me, the old King's Road was the route that they had taken. It was a highway built started by the Native Americans, built upon by the British as a transportation route to get crops from southern Florida up to St. Augustine where they could be redistributed out to the rest of the empire. Unfortunately today, the old King's Road, there's hardly any of it left. A majority of it was actually repurposed for US-1. Um, other parts of it that do exist are on private property. So doing the hike along US-1, it kind of loses the historical significance. You know, you're seeing similar to what they would have seen, but something about going 
by way of beach that just feels very special and it just the story of Francisco Pellicer, Lambius, and Genopoli making their daring escape up the coast. Something romantic about that. Um, in a perfect world, I would be able to do the old King's Road, but until I figure out how to get permission from all of these individuals and how to make US-1 a little bit safer, you know, we're going to have to wait on that idea. So. The other thing we want to do is we want to create a short documentary about the hike, but more so about current day Menorcan history and culture. We want to create a time capsule of what modern day Menorcans, today's modern day, what Menorcans are doing with their culture and with their history. We're going to conduct a series of interviews with a variety of people throughout the St. Augustine and New Smyrna area. And we're going to create some sort of video where we can share it with you all. Hopefully it gives an experience similar to coming on the trail with me and taking a hike. I wanted people to experience it for themselves. I wanted them to get out and replicate my hike, which, very exciting news. We actually have a Menorcan family coming down <clears throat> from North Carolina this Thanksgiving. They're going to be starting here at the museum, and they're going to be biking up to St. Augustine. So they reached out, and they said, can you send us your GPS coordinates? We want to follow your route. And I said, well, it's not my route. It's the Menorcan's route. But you're welcome to follow it if you'd like. So we're looking forward to meeting them. It's very exciting seeing this little idea that I had actually become a real thing. You know, like I've said over and over again, nothing makes me happier than people getting out there, being a part of history, and actually experiencing stuff. But for those of you who don't feel like walking or biking 68 miles, hopefully our short documentary can supplement that for you. Rather than raising $1,798, we're looking to raise $20,000 for Coquina and Tabby Preservation. I mentioned our walls at the museum are Coquina and the floors are Tabby. Similar to Coquina, however, a little more manufactured. It's a mixture of smoked or excuse me, it's a mixture of limestone, smoked shells, um, sand, and a few other pieces, and it's more of a poured concrete. So our floors in the museum are made out of tabby, and just like Coquina, requires special maintenance. So I figured we don't need to be so strict with it this year. We can open it up to tabby as well, which I, uh, again, I specifically signed a contract saying that the money raised <laughs> can only be used for coquina preservation and basically what we've done is we have the money from last year and we just got our historic architect report from a historical architect named Joseph Opperman. He's written a report on the house about how we need to go forward to um, <clears throat> restore the modern day museum. Our goal is to have the house completely relined by 20, the 250th anniversary in 2026. So we got a couple of years to go, we got some more money to raise, but hopefully this 20,000 can get a couple of rooms done and uh, I'd be pretty proud of that. <clears throat> of course, I want to continue promoting historic preservation and showcasing the history surrounding St. Augustine. When we talk to people in St. Augustine, it's like they think this is the world you need to realize that there's a bigger picture. And when you get out there and explore the surrounding areas, everything in St. Augustine makes a little more sense. Mm -hmm. So every time people come into the museum, we're like, hey, have you been to New Smyrna yet? You gotta go see it. So it's been really great, you know, having people venture out and see that there is more to our history, all of our history, when you just kind of expand and look outside of what you're used to. And vice versa as well. We've had a lot of you guys come up and visit us in St. Augustine, which we actually had two there this morning, which <laughs> nothing makes us happier than when people from New Smyrna come up and actually see the house. It really, you know, not only are we sharing our history with you, but it's making that connection of this bigger picture for everyone. Can I use your boat? <laughs> That's it. Um, so one of the, the things I want to change about the hike, of course, we're going to be filming a lot of it. One of the big things that I want to do is eliminate the section of US-1 getting out of New Smyrna. I'm not going to lie to you guys, it was a little sketchy. I'm sure you've all driven that and it was not very fun. So not only would I be eliminating that, but if I get a boat, this is what I want to do. I want to get a boat, walk out to um, <clears throat> New Smyrna Beach, get on the boat, and then go across the Ponce Inlet, 
get off the boat, and then keep going north. And that would allow me to talk about the Ponce Lighthouse and the Bassetti Hotel. As I'm sure a lot of you guys know from previous speakers who've stood where I've stood right now, um, the Pasetti Hotel and the Ponce Lighthouse is a long, long, long Menorcan history. It was a fishing resort for northerners, and according to newspapers, this is where you catch the best fish in the entire country. <laughs> so people were staying here, and it was a Menorcan-owned boarding house, which relates to our history as well, so there's an even bigger bond between the two places. And I would love to incorporate this history into my hike as well. Um, I want to focus on Menorcan history, throughout time, not just the 1768 to 1777 window, because we've all heard that story. But there's so many more stories to be told along the way, like the Ponce Lighthouse and the Ponce family who lived there. Um, we do have a few other things planned for the hike, but you're just going to have to wait. Well, I'm telling you right now, I can't give away all my secrets. Uh, but if you look here to the left, you can see some of our coquina on the museum. This section here has seen some better days, but the lime wash is designed to come off. Uh, you can see how it's been peeling over time. That's actually a breezeway, so when the wind picks up, it whips through that corridor and it just pulls the lime wash off with it. On really windy days, it blows right into your eye and you have to walk blind <laughs> through the courtyard and it's, uh, it's an eventful day. Over here we have some tabby. That's actually the floor to our original 225-year-old staircase that we have in the museum. And again, Tabby there has seen some better days. Another difficult historic preservation lesson that we learned, you can see this little patch here. That's actually Portland cement. That's a big no-no. You don't do that. Portland cement is harder than Tabby. So when Tabby can flex and move, the Portland cement's not going anywhere, and this causes fractures in the tabby itself, over time destroying it. So what we want to do with the money we're raising this year is get rid of the Portland cement and return it all back to the tabby that we have had the whole time. So You never know better than what people were doing back then. You know, we think we're so smart, but they, they knew what they were doing. You know, it wasn't easy to survive back then. You had to know what you were doing, so... The other thing we are, plan or we are planning on doing is we're going to throw a big party. So when I come across the finish line at the end of my hike, we're going to have a band that plays at the art gallery across the street playing music. We're going to have food, drinks, history talks from Menorcans and other historians here in town. So we're going to have a big celebration for the hike itself. And if you're interested in joining us for this soiree, we'll call it, you can actually get your tickets by donating to the hike itself. So not only are you enjoying a fabulous party, you're also supporting historic preservation in our nation's oldest city. You also see right there on the right, we have one of our more famous photographs. Up there on the balcony is Louisa Facio. Down here are some of the guests staying at the boarding house. We also have one of the slaves who worked in the house here on the corner. And I should have put the picture in here. We recreated this picture. It's very, very funny. Um, so if you're interested in donating, where is your money going? Of course it's going to Coquina Preservation, but it's so much more than that. You're going to support a 225-year-old home in St. Augustine. We are one of 31 Coquina houses left in the city which Coquina being a defining aspect of our historic district, only having 31 is a little unnerving. And what the big problem with this is, is because the Castillo de San Marco is also Coquina, and it's owned by the national parks, all Coquina reserves are reserved for the fort. So if something happens to our Coquina walls, we're out of luck. You know, so we need to do what we can do to keep this place together for another 225, year old, 225 years. Because at that point, there's going to be someone standing in this museum saying, and then a guy named Ryan walked all the way up from New Smyrna, and the money he raised saved all of these coquina walls. We're the last coquina building. Hopefully not, but one of 31 original coquina houses. And to me, it's important. It's the most important. Coquina is the defining feature of St. Augustine. The National Park System dubbed it the stone that saved St. Augustine because prior to the Coquina Fort, we had a wooden fort. 
And that fort was burnt to the ground eight different times, I believe, until they finally built it out of Coquina. After that, the fort was never taken by force, only signed peacefully by contract. Because that Coquina, when you fire a cannonball at it, the little air pockets that are left behind between the shells actually collapse and catch that cannonball. If you go to the fort, they'll tell you it's like pushing your thumb into a Rice Krispie treat. <laughs> but now imagine being one of the attacking groups, typically British or American. You sail down from Georgia in your ship, you spend all day firing cannonballs at the fort, you go home, have a nice dinner, take a nap, come back the next day, all your cannonballs are gone, and all the holes are filled in. It's like you were never even there. Can you imagine? Like, it's... So, if you're planning on building a fort, do it out of Coquina. It's good stuff. <clears throat> and again, historic preservation, saving these historic places, offers us an anchor to the past without places like the Jimenez Facio House, without places like the New Smyrna Museum of History. History is stories, it's memories, it's things that changed and are forgotten. And when you have a physical location like a house or a restaurant or anything along those lines, it offers people the experience of going in and feeling what it was like back then. Especially when you come in July or August, people always note, wow, it's hot in here. Can you imagine wearing wool back then? And it really gives them a certain, no air conditioning, certain appreciation for what people were going through back then. And I think a lot of the time, the idea that people in the past are human, just like you and I, gets lost. You know, we assume because they're from a long time ago, they didn't know what they were doing. But they were smart for their situation. You know, if you put me back then, I would be considered the idiot. I don't know what to do. You know, I don't know how to skin a mullet. What am I going to do? So... It really is perspective, and so having historic places, museums, landmarks, battlefields, places to go experience history, keeps those memories more than memories. It makes them real, so preserving these places is essential. You'd also be participating in St. Augustine and the South in general's long tradition of community historic preservation. The Colonial Danes were actually one of the first groups in St. Augustine to do such a thing. Legend has it they were going to tear down the city gates at the end of St. George Street. They had a meeting at City Hall. All the men get together, harumph, 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 right? And so what the story was, was the ladies of the colonial dames take their chairs and their tea sets, and they go set them up between the gates and host a tea party as a protest to them tearing down the city gates. This happened in 1919, so a very long time ago. And those gates, of course, are still there. So what they did worked, and they got to have a tea party in the middle of all of it. <laughs> Lucky them. But really what it all comes down to is whether you're giving a dollar or a thousand, any support helps. You are becoming a part of making and preserving history. And that's really important to us and to the community as a whole. Again, what would our identity be if St. Augustine was just pictures of old buildings and not actually old buildings? Now, if you're interested, we do have tiered out donations, so we're not going to bog you down with all that information now. But if you are interested in donating, we do have handouts here. I can give you one of those. You can visit the JimenezFacioHouse.org, and on our website will be more information about things that I just told you, as well as a sheet for you to donate your money. And of course, however much you donate will correspond with the different tiers that we have here. But seriously, from the bottom of my heart, thank you all so much for coming out tonight.